But, you know, the thing that I tell investors is always like, this is about your quality of life. This is not about gambling. This is not about making trade of, uh, trade of the century. This is about your quality of life. And it should occupy 20 or 30 minutes of your day. No longer. You shouldn't be staring at the price charts. You shouldn't be staring at the, you know, these things ticking up and down. You should just place your trades once a day and shut the whole thing down and not even worry about it. And watch your gains accrue over very long periods of time. Take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. You and I are going to have a conversation about Naked Hedgy, which is, was it um, trend following? Oh, trend following. I could talk about trend following for a very long time. For a very, but in particular about the service that you offer uh, to people, because this is how you make a living, right? And yeah. uh, doing it for a while. Well, that's, yeah, that's the day job. That's what I call the day job. So yes. I... I, uh, I set up uh, a website, it's called iSystem Trend Following, and I have a company, it's called Craner Analytics, that is based on the technology that I've developed uh, in 1999, so what is it, we're going on 25 years, and basically what it does is it's, um, it's a trend following system, it's kind of like a... Okay, hold on, hold on a second, before we go into okay. that, right, let, let's find out a little bit about just about your background. And, and how you got into trend following? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, um, I, was, uh, I was working here in Monaco, uh, where I still live, uh, for, a, for a commodities trading company. And in, it was based in Geneva, Switzerland. And here in Monaco, we were trading oil. So we were literally trading physical cargoes of, of crude oil and oil derivatives like, uh, like heating oil, gas oil, uh, gasoline and stuff like that so we were literally floating tankers on the sea and and buying and selling cargoes and so the biggest risk for the company was exactly the risk of exposure to the price of oil mm -hmm. and it usually worked out so that we would easily lose you know you, you made five profitable transactions and then one bad transactions would usually wipe out the profits from the previous five transactions <laughs> so uh, at one you know because once upon a time the margins on these trades were much more generous right so every time you every time you traded a cargo you made uh, decent money you know long time ago it was a dollar a barrel and then it started to become like 15 cents a barrel and then 11 cents a barrel if you were lucky and so uh, the company was increasingly dependent on price speculation. So if you if you bought it at an advantageous price and you sold it well, then you made some money. Mm -hmm. But very often the opposite happened: that you paid more than what you sold it for because the 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 cargos are always um, marked to to market to to price fluctuations in the in the market. And so at one point. This was in 1997. The you know the the owner he he asked me to because I was I was the most in the, in the company. I had the most you know uh, uh, mathematical and computer um, skills. Let's call it that. And so they were like, well, you know, we you know maybe we need to figure out some uh, our, the way we the way we manage risk, we need to figure out some more sophisticated ways so that we make more money than we lose when we're wrong. And so that became my job, and I hired a small team of uh, programmers and and scientists, you know, uh, mathematicians. But we basically started from a blank page. We didn't we didn't know how we were going to fix this problem. So it was a it was about two and a half years of. Uh, brainstorming studying researching reading books testing various mathematical models to you know forecasting time series it's, you know like so you take a time series of something whatever and then you analyze it and then 
based on that analysis, you produce a forecast. Okay, well, so from based on what we know about the past, we are here. And in the future, most probably this is going to happen. Except I never really believed in this. I thought you, you cannot predict what's going to happen tomorrow. You cannot predict what's going to happen a week or a month from now. It's impossible. So I knew that all these models, you know, well, well they may be applicable to to things in nature, like the flow of air, uh, the mixing of liquids, uh, things like this. I, I didn't think that it could, it could apply to markets. But at the same time, you know, I, I observed, uh, because this was during the dot-com bubble in the late 1990s, you know, we, we had the uh, NASDAQ technology stocks were going uh, vertical. And it was also at the time when oil prices were going from um, low $20 a barrel to single digits. At the beginning of 1998, the crude oil fell well below $10 a barrel. And all these events were happening as trends. It was just going up and up and up and up. And I remember it was December 1996 when Alan Greenspan said, oh, you know, the stocks are overvalued. Uh, he warned the markets against uh, irrational exuberance. Except from the moment that he issued that warning until the peak of the dot-com bubble, the Nasdaq went up uh, four or five times. And just in the last five months of that bubble, the Nasdaq rose 110%. Wow. And so I thought, guys, why are we breaking our heads with how to forecast things that can, we cannot forecast when clearly markets are moving in trends? So let's just study trends. Let's figure out how to navigate these trends so that we are on the right side of them. You know, like when you get this big uh, price rise that you're long, or if you get a market collapse that you're short. And that you are long, that you are right more often than you're wrong. Well, you can't really do that. But let's say you can be right and wrong about 50-50. Let's say that's that's about the best you can do. That you are half half the time you're wrong and half the times you're right. But what you can do very effectively is to make sure that when you're right, you are you make a decent windfall. But when you're wrong. You, your losses are, are contained. That you can do. It's a basic, you know what they say, let your profits run, cut your losses short. That's, that's a timeless wisdom of experienced investors. And that's basically what it, what it boils down to. And so we ended up building this, uh, this model because we didn't know how to do this. But my, my idea was that if I, if I look at a price chart of something, and I see this curve and it's going in some direction. And then I, I make a judgment, oh, this is an uptrend or this is a downtrend. Well, then my brain's got to be doing some kind of trigonometry and we should try to reverse engineer that. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the route we took. And so we looked at price charts of stuff and we said, okay, what makes me think that this is an uptrend or that this is a downtrend? What am I looking at? And so we would say like, oh, well, look, you have a series of higher peaks and higher troughs. Well, that's what makes, it, what makes an uptrend, right? Or you have a series of declining peaks and declining troughs. That's a downtrend, right? And so we came up with five different uh, tentative definitions of what makes a trend. And then we, uh, we built algorithms that would do a similar function as what we presume human brain does when when you look at a price of something and then we put all those all these uh, algorithms to work at the same time and each one then produces some output let's say one of them says it's an uptrend the other one says i don't know the third one says yeah it's an uptrend the second one says it's a downtrend and then you put an executive process like a like a like a chairman of the board right who collects these experts' um, opinions at all times, weighs them because, I don't know, one of them is super highly competent, the other one is so-so, and then he weighs them, right? And then every day like that, you have a numerically exact evaluation of what the trend is. And the trend basically spans a, a confidence range, right? Because when you look at something, it's seldom that you say like, okay, I'm 100% sure that this is an uptrend. Mm. You might say, mm, I, well, you, you're going to think that when the market is at the top, right? Like, like today, 
you know, uh, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq are trading very near to their all-time highs. And at that point, you can say, okay, 100% sure that this is an uptrend. The only problem is at that point, it's not exactly the right time to be taking a risk in the markets, right? But during the most time in the market, your confidence that you're looking at an uptrend and a downtrend is going to be fluctuating between zero and one. So one is you're certain, zero is you have no idea. And then at all times, your confidence is going to be somewhere in between. So we constructed a trend confidence function. Right. A, 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 a curve that based on all these algorithms is constantly fluctuating between zero and one or zero and minus one in case of a downtrend. And then once we had that uh, confidence function and it looked like what we wanted it to look like, it, it, it looked like it resembles human judgment. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, we could say like, okay, so what threshold of confidence would justify taking a risk here? Because, you know, as I, as I mentioned, you can't wait until you're 100% certain to start buying into an uptrend because maybe most of the trend is behind. So yeah. maybe it's too late. So what is it? Is it 50%? Is it, is it 70%? We, we didn't have an answer, but once we had the curve, we could go back and test Right, and we can say like, okay, go with like fifty percent confidence. Okay, what about fifty-five? What about sixty percent? What about forty-five? What about thirty-five? What about thirty? And you know, we came to the realization that most of the time it's about thirty-five percent. So when the when the trend function goes above thirty-five percent in an uptrend or minus thirty-five percent in a downtrend, that is the time when you take a risk. Right. Yeah, and so. You know, this is something that an algorithm, a computer program can do, with, but it is extremely difficult for a human to do because it's, you're not really inclined to take much risk when your confidence is only 35%, right? But then again, you know, we have, we have this system of generating buy and sell decisions and we can go back in, in time and we can test it and we can see what results it gives. And so I, I have now, uh, you know, 30, 35 years of um, price data in my database for about 4,000 markets. Wow. So, you know, when you can test your decision-making behavior on 35 years of history, and you see that certain behaviors keep repeating themselves over that time, then you can be fairly confident that if you continue doing that same thing, that over time, it's going to work out. Yes. And it does. It really does. The only question is, you know, it's the, the only article of faith here is that we started on the premise that markets move in trends. And there are people who reject that premise. You know, they say like, no, 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 markets fluctuate randomly. Okay, whatever. So that's an article of faith. I believe that markets do move in trends. And I think that for any person with common sense, it's enough to look at a bunch of price charts of things to see that markets indeed move in trends. Now, markets move in trends. And Alex, can I stop you there? Don't stop you there and just sure, yeah, yeah, I yeah. can say what I hear and what you're saying, right? So one is there's a capacity that you and I as human beings have for pattern recognition. And you are particularly skilled in a particular arena for pattern recognition. You could probably look at a candlestick chart and, yeah. and see things that I wouldn't necessarily see. Yes, yes. That's that's true. That's correct. Then the problem that you have is you're a human being. Yes. And then you have emotions like fear and greed. Like I can read a chart. I, I don't trade. I don't trust myself here, right? Because mm -hmm. I get too excited or too upset or something like that, right? Because I don't manage my emotions. And then so you've created an algorithm which does the pattern recognition that you, you back tested it. It's devoid of emotion. And it just tells you when to place a trade or, or, or to get out of a trade. Yeah, and exactly. Uh, back tested 35 years of data and then you and then the, the other thing about trading is not putting in all your capital to trade you just trade a little bit and, and the yep. game is I, I think the game is to uh, put, put in small amounts small amounts small amounts uh, and over time as long as 51% of the trades come through at least you're going to make a profit yeah, that's about right. And I think that you you stumble onto one of the most important questions is how much risk do you take on every trade? And this is, you know, today with the with these modern uh, brokerage platforms and accounts, you you know, it's you you can be leveraged a hundred times. So you know, like you can 
you can put ten million, ten thousand dollars into a trading account, and you can buy one million dollars worth of something. And so, I think that where people make mistakes is that they, 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 they go too aggressive. You know, they they say like, oh, for sure this is going to go up higher, and they think like, oh, I'm going to make a bunch of money here, and so they they get leveraged up to the eyeballs, and then you know, that time when you're wrong. Uh, you're going to sustain very difficult, very, very heavy losses. And it's often very difficult to bounce back from those losses. So vast majority of people, we're talking about probably uh, on the order of 80%, give or take, uh, end up losing money when they do this. But it's not, you know, it's not inevitable. You just have to, um, what I advise people to do is to target um, returns that should be in the high teens and low 20s, right? So if you target 20% per annum returns, that's fantastic. That is what the best of the best of professional investors try to generate per annum. And over longer periods of time, the best of the best of the best will be around 15, 16, 70% after fees. So but the problem is that when you start trading, uh, and you can leverage as much as you like almost, and you easily see your account value go up 5% a day, and you think like, wow, you know, like I, I should be able to make, to double my money here easily. But the likelihood of you doubling your money is very close to zero. So, you know, people shouldn't try to do that. People should really try to aim for high teens, low 20s. And for anybody who's starting out, what I would advise is start trading really, really small. Mm -hmm. You know, start trading so that your daily profit and losses is something that you, you barely even notice. You know, like very small positions. Just to get the feeling of it. Just to get, you know, to, to, to see how it goes. And then as you get more comfortable, maybe you can add, you can add risk. But, you know, it's, it's like, it's like if, you, if you had a motorbike, you know, the faster you go, the more likely you are to get hurt. And, you know, like with investing, it's not, it's not gambling. It's, you should be looking to build up your wealth for life. You know, this is not doubling your money in a year. This is not making a trade of the century this week. Yeah. This yeah. is about taking what you have yep. you, you should you should think of it as a seedling take what you have cultivate it and if it grows by 15 or 20 percent per annum you know that compounds and that seedling at one point is going to become a tree and it's going to become strong and stable and robust and at one point that tree is going to be big enough that it's going to give you um, how do you call it a crop? And a, and, and a dividend without you having to sacrifice the tree itself. Yes. So I think, and how much does it, does it take to go from a seedling to a, to a tree that gives a crop uh, every season? You know, for anybody who's done a little bit of agriculture, it's about six, seven years. And so you should be prepared to, you know, if you're, if you're going to manage your investments, and I, I'm afraid that we all are kind of obliged to do that, because our money is evaporating, right? Inflation is eating it away. Uh, then you have to, I think you have to be prepared to do this for a long time. And that means that you have to keep your risks low so that when you get it wrong, the losses don't keep you up at night. And they, they, then the losses don't scare you into some desperate gambit to try to recover. And uh, you just have to wait and give it time for for your portfolio to to grow large enough that you are that you are then that you have maybe even a, a comfortable source of income or dividends or a comfortable supplement to your income. And and uh, that also just to add a few things, you stay in the game. And the thing that you're you're saying implicitly, not explicitly, is don't put in any more than you can afford to lose. Exactly. And yeah. Slowly, exactly. slowly, it builds and builds and builds and builds. Yeah. Keeps yeah, you in yeah. the game. But it's exactly. being, got to be responsible 
I, I suppose, Alice, it's a little bit like being a father. You know, you got I got to cultivate my children and, and nurture them and take care of them and take care of them. They're not going to be strapping adults instantly. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, I I really think that this whole business of trend following, the strategy itself, is is actually a fantastic school of life because mm. it's just as you say, it's applicable to so many different things: to raising children, to to uh, developing a business, to developing yourself as a as a human being. You know, mm. uh, it's you can't you can't move away from the status quo without taking any risk. Yes. So you know, if you're going to change your condition, you have to take a risk of some of some sort. And you have to take that risk when you're convinced that it's it's worthwhile. But you will also find that many times, even when you're super convinced that you're doing the right thing, it's not going to work out correctly. It's not going to work out the way you expect it to. So you're going to have moments when, you know, risk taking is going to go wrong. So then you have to learn that, okay, so this is part of life. This this happens. It's not exceptional. It's systematic. Okay, then I have to make sure that when I do take a risk, my risk is properly sized. So, so if it goes bad, that I didn't eliminate myself from the game, that I didn't, you know, destroy a, my, you know. It's going to be a calculated risk. And then uh, the, there's something else that you're demonstrating. Uh, which I know as a social worker is the key to success in life, impulse control. Yes. You know the marshmallow te experiment, right? So then what you're talking about is how the service that you provide and the way that you work and you encourage and support others to trade through trend following is impulse control. So all the way restraining impulses for recklessness yes. and folly. Exactly, exactly. And, and this is really, really carefully. And, and this is what brings me back to the to the model that we developed. Yeah, because I, you know, like I, from the very, from the get go, I was, I was, uh, I was kind of afraid of this. I was afraid of all this. I was, I was, um, how do you call it? I, I knew enough, you know, through through research, through reading, to know that there were many, many, many of those traders who were, you know, these larger than life geniuses <coughs> that people looked up to. Mm -hmm. You know, like like uh, Leon, uh, Jesse Livermore, Warren Buffett. Well, Jesse Liv. No, Warren Buffett is not a good example, actually. You know, he's been successful for a very long time. But you know, like you had people like Jesse Livermore, more like the guy who crashed Bearings Bank, uh, um, Leeson, um, Michael Berry. No, 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 Leeson, Leeson. He's I, I can't remember his first first name now. Nick Leeson, Nick Leeson. Right. You know, like these these geniuses. Um, who for for several years had the world dazzled with their genius with their ability to make millions and billions of dollars trading you know and then they ended up crashing into a pile of um ashes you know lose everything uh nick leeson destroyed bearings bank single-handedly wow. um there's a lot of these people. Bill Huang, just a couple of years ago, you know, he he made he he was managing twenty billion dollars of his own. You know, he was a billionaire. He made immense amounts of money investing, and then he managed to lose the whole twenty billion dollars in uh, in the space of two days, all of it. So you know, I I knew I knew many of these cases. I read about all this stuff, and I thought. Why should I trust myself to be the big genius? And what's the point of doing this if maybe at the end of your career, you're, you're going to end your career with a big, spectacular own goal from which there's no recovering? Mm. And then not to mention, you're developing a skill that's of no use to society in general. You know, you know you're, just, you're just a speculator. A derivatives trader, yeah. And so I thought it would be better to develop a system that protects me from my own impulses right protects me from my fear protects me from my greed and tells me today you're buying this and then the next day it tells me now you're selling that and i can calculate you know so you cannot predict what happens in the future 
But one thing that you can do very reliably and very accurately is to measure risk. Mm. Okay, so <clears throat> if I buy one barrel of oil today, I can very accurately predict how much I'm going to make or or lose on a typical day or what's going to be the 1% of the biggest up or down days. So if I buy a bar barrel of oil, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking like this, but I can know that on a typical day, I'm going to make or lose $2, right? $70 investment, it, it fluctuates on average day, $2. And if I if I'm very unlucky and I have like a very very like a three sigma day, you know like one percent uh, of the of the biggest days uh, over over time, well then on that day I'm going to lose maybe five dollars. Right. Okay. So I know that. So then you know I can calculate given given the size of my portfolio how many barrels of oils of oil should I be trading, so that these daily gains and losses are in such a range that I sleep at night and they generate me a, a reasonable return on investment. And I, you know, I, as again, you know, you, you want to target something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I've, I've got a few rapid fire questions, right? So yeah. How long have you been doing this? 25 years. 25 years, right? Yeah. And you're tracking hundreds of commodities. I'm trading a. I'm I'm tracking a total of about 200 markets, of which, you know, maybe about 30 commodities. Uh, um, the rest are financials, you know, uh, st stock indices, things like FTSE, like, and then uh, Treasury futures, like gilt, U.S. 10-year note, and 30-year bond, and things okay. like that, and and, and and about 100 currency pairs. Okay, and then you put in. Um the algorithms would use technical analysis, but do you do any fundamental analysis as well? No. Okay, so it's no. all technical analysis. It's all technical analysis. Uh, I, you know, fu fundamental analysis I don't use because it's not, uh, let's say that we've tested a lot of things to check whether it adds value. And we really couldn't figure out a way to make fundamental analysis that add value. Right. And then, the, anyway, fundamental analysis, I think, shows up in the candlestick charts anyway, eventually. Well, you know, the, the premise of what goes on into those charts is that everything that is known to all the market participants and to the extent that it's relevant to this market is already reflected in the price. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so, you know. And then, and then if I wanted to use your service, what is it? I, I'd sign up and then I'd give, I'd give you money or something? Oh, okay, so I, I have a I have a news I have a daily newsletter with right. which I communicate these buy and sell decisions for subscribers. So what you would do is you would su subscribe to the newsletter. But um, the problem is that my newsletter is a little bit pricey because I you know I, I I kind of do it the pedestrian way, and I can't handle a very large volume of subscribers. So I, I've resisted so Alex, far. Let me, let, let me put that another way, right? It's an no, 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 because I'm, I'm going to make a point. It's an exclusive that I might, premium service currently. Yeah, it's a premium service, but it's, you know, like it's a premium service because I can't handle the volume. But I've, I've decided that, I've, you know, I've been, I've been writing on Substack now for two years. Right. And, I, you know, Substack has grown leaps and bounds, and they, they've developed certain things that I think are solving some of these problems for me. And so what I'm going to do, uh, maybe maybe starting already Monday, maybe starting now at the beginning of October 2024, I'm going to launch a Substack newsletter. Mm -hmm. And because Substack is taking care of all the you know subscriptions, payments, and all of this, I'm going to be able to to lower the price very considerably. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna launch a, I think a. A newsletter covering about um, twenty markets, more or less. You know, S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, FTSE, DAX, um, dollar yen, dollar euro, gold, silver. A couple of things like that, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be five trend following strategies per market, and those five trend following strategies per market are going to be gener generating the buy and sell decisions, and uh, I'll, I'll see how it works uh, with Substack. 
And if that works, then that's going to be a, a considerably cheaper um, way to subscribe to my service. Right. And, and just to be clear, you don't take any, you don't hold anybody's money. You're not investing for anyone. I, if I were a subscriber, you'd say... No, you would have to do that for yourself. I then place the buy and sell order. Yeah, you would have to have your own brokerage account or whatever. Um, and you would, you would manage those trades yourself. And then w w what sort of time frame do you, are your trades on? <clears throat> Days, weeks, months? Okay, so generally the, the, you know, the system uh, uh, we developed can, can accommodate short cycle trends, long cycle trends, and anything in between. So what's a short cycle? Okay, so let's say the short cycle trend is something that might switch from long to short every couple of weeks. Right. Now, long cycle trends might stay in a, in, in, on one side of the market in a long position for many months, maybe sometimes even a year or two or three. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, based on 25 years of experience and literally millions of these backtest simulations, um, I can categorically say that the strategies that work best and they are most reliable are long cycle strategies. But those are also the ones that test people's patience the most because they are the, you know, let's say you're following a nice trend and it's going up and up and up and up and you're very, very happy because you made money. Yeah. But then that trend is going to reverse at some point. And so a short cycle strategy will throw you out of that trade much, much closer to the top and might even throw you into a short trade. So you're going to be profiting even on the, of, of the thing going down. Mm. But the thing is, you know, very often you get a correction, not a reversal, and then it goes back up and then it goes a little bit down. So you get like, you can get like many, many months of just price consolidation going horizontally, no trend. So these short cycle strategies, what they do is they'll, they'll go short, and then when the price goes back up, then they go, oh, they go long, and then they go short, and then they go long, and they always trail the price. So they end up uh, making a lot of these small losses along the way. So for the whole duration of this price consolidation period, these strategies will actually get negative performance, whereas a long cycle strategy will not budge just because market corrected, you know, 5% or 10% or even, you know, 15%, it'll still keep you long and it will avoid getting chopped up, you know, uh, in these, in these horizontal periods. So over long periods of time, these strategies tend to perform best, but, you know, that means that you have to sit there and you have to be content to watch, you know, nothing happen, you know, like watch paint dry. But, you know, the thing that I tell investors is always like, this is about your quality of life. This is not about gambling. This is not about making trade of uh, trade of the century. This is about your quality of life. And it should occupy 20 or 30 minutes of your day. No longer. You shouldn't be staring at the price charts. You shouldn't be staring at the, you know, these things ticking up and down. You should just place your trades once a day and shut the whole thing down and not even worry about it. And so watch your gains accrue over very long periods of time and spend time with your kids, read a book, go for a walk, exercise. Read, um, read one of your Substack articles. Read my Substack articles. <laughs> Watch the Crypto Rich podcasts. <laughs> you know, because when people get into trading, it very often starts to occupy a huge chunk of their day. They stare, yeah. they stare at the screen, they place trades, put them on, take them off keep wondering, what should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? And, you know, what's the point? Uh, it's, it's, it's better to do other things with your life and allow an autopilot to make those decisions for you. Yeah, okay. Now, because it's a newsletter and then it's up to individual subscribers to tr place the trades or not, they can then determine how much they're going to put in. So once you launch the Substack, it could work for small players as well. It doesn't have to be large investors. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the whole point. They could do that, yeah. That's the whole point. And, and then do you offer any coaching calls or private Zoom calls or anything? Or uh, nothing that? Nothing um, systematic in that sense yet. Nothing uh, structured. What happens generally is that people ask me questions. Mm -hmm. And then I try to give them the best answer I can. And, oh, well, okay, so I launched my newsletter uh, four and a half years ago 
in January 2020. And uh, based on all these questions, the most important of the questions, I've put together a page on my on my uh, website called Trend Compass User Manual. So mm -hmm. that that page kind of condenses the most relevant lessons and the and answers to to most inter interesting most important questions that came from from traders and and, and subscribers. So that's a resource. Uh, I think that yeah, you know, I have to see how it goes with Substack because you know Substack is not only a platform for. And I'm not plugging them. I have nothing, you know. I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a user, but it's a platform for distributing newsletters uh, and articles. But it also allows you to, you know, it it allows you to uh, do podcasts, uh, to do video content. So I, you know, like I'll see if if it's uh, appropriate, if it's suitable for uh, courses mm -hmm. and for maybe, uh, you know calls like like zoom type calls where from time to time you can you know have a call with your subscribers and then go over questions and issues and you know things that are things that people want to ask about but um you know sure and then alex it's a silly question well it might not be. it's actually a very sensible question do people actually make money from using your service well yeah but it again again i have to say it depends how they use it you know and you know, to put it in the simple metaphor, it's like if I gave you a car, uh, you know, if you drive it carefully and responsibly, it'll get you where you want to go. If right. you if you run wild and step on the gas pedal to the metal, you're probably going to end up hurting yourself. So, right. um, yeah, I have I have subscribers who write me back and who, who tell me that it's working uh, wonderfully for them. And I also know one person at least who uh, who blew up, uh, and you know he asked a lot of questions. We had extensive communication, and I kept telling him, uh, "Please drive it in the slow lane. Don't be aggressive." And in the end, you know, he he told me uh, he couldn't handle himself. He was he couldn't you know he couldn't handle the temptation, and so yeah, it's not for everybody. You know, some no. people. But, For some but, people, but it's better not to trade. You know, buy some gold, silver, buy a plot of land, uh, and you know that's that's also quite sensible. Yeah, and the thing that you're pointing to is, in the end, with your service, it's like if I were to subscribe or anyone were to subscribe to your service, the subscriber is responsible. Yes, yes, I'm responsible. Absolutely. You suggest, okay, buy this this asset at this price, and it's down to me whether I. I don't know, yeah. put it ten dollars, a hundred dollars, or I sell my wife and my children and my house and my underwear. It's my call. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But you know, I in in all of these newsletters, I every day my newsletters have a commentary in it, and very often I talk about risk management. Yeah. And on my on my user, uh, how do you call it, user manual page, I also there's a there's a there's an Excel file, uh, which people can download for free uh, to measure the riskiness of any assets. You know, they just have to copy paste the, the time series, you know, the price uh, series. And then, you know, the, it, it's going, it, it's that thing. Like if I buy a barrel of oil, you know, on a typical day, I get, I'm going to be losing or making $2 or on a really bad day, I'm going to be losing or making five or $6. So then, you know, am I okay making or losing $500 a day, you know, that's a decision you have to make. So there's a little, little Excel sheet that makes that value at risk calculation. And then you can use that to, you know, to calculate what size trades you should do when you get like a buy signal or, or a sell signal. The most, we didn't talk about this, but the most wonderful thing about trend following mm. is that you can also profit in, in, in bear markets. So if there's a stock market crash, you know, there's going to be a tipping point where it's going to tell you to go short. Yeah. And when you go short, then you profit from the the market collapsing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's what you get from trend following. You don't get it from fundamentals analysis and from these classic, you know, 60-40 portfolios and, you know, long only stocks. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, if somebody wanted to subscribe, can they test it out for a bit? Yeah, yeah. I always give a, I always give a, a month free. One month is always free, but in in practice, I try to make that a bit more than one month because you know I like I like for people to have a to have a good feel about 
what it is that this strategy entails, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I'll have the links in the description below so people can go and try this out and profit from it. I assume this is how you make a living. This is how I make a living. Yeah. This is how I've made a living for the last, um, oh, uh, since 2003. Right. Yeah. That's it. And the, do you know what that, that suggests like a certain expertise? What is it? Um, the guy who wrote Tipping Point. Ah, uh, yeah, I know about the book. I don't know the guy who wrote but, it. But he wrote a book about genius that it takes ten thousand hours. So you oh yeah, have, yeah, yeah. You have done at least ten thousand hours. Yes. Of practice at this, right? So you got a certain amount of facility, and this is also explains how come you're so freed up to write a great at Substack and appear on podcasts all over the place and do your fundamental analysis because you do your twenty. Maybe you do a bit more than twenty thirty minutes a day. Because you go no, I do a lot more than that because I, I write I write my I write my newsletter every day yeah. and I, I, I truly pour my heart and soul into that newsletter and it usually takes me two to three hours a day. So so what does the newsletter say? Because if all I need to know is buy and sell based upon an algorithm, what's in the newsletter? Well, you know, it the newsletter talks about you know uh, events in the world today and how they might impact market, you know, including geopolitics. Um, it talks about the psychology of trading. It talks about risk management. It talks about uh, you know uh, trend following as a strategy in general. Uh, sometimes it talks about history, about uh, psychology, um, things like that. You know, it's uh, five five days a week or seven days a week. Five five days a week. Five days a week. Wow! Every day. Every day. Every day. Wow! Mm -hmm. Well, that would be worth it just to. Uh just to get your thoughts on what's going on in the world. I'm always interested in that. Yeah, yeah, you know, some <laughs> some subscribers tell me like, oh, yeah, you know, like I, I can't use the signals because I don't want to trade like this, but I, I love the commentary. Where can I, where can I read your stuff uh, without having to pay for the signals? And that's, that's kind of how this, my, my Substack newsletter started out. But I, I write, you know, I publish a few, a few articles a month on Substack. But those are free. There's no, there's no paywall. Nothing is behind the paywall. Uh, so that one is for free. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna really over the next couple of days, I'm gonna ask, I, I'm gonna add a publication which is going to be with the signals, but it's, it's going to be a fraction of what, what my subscription rates are now. Very good, very good, Alex. Anything else you want to let us know or let people know? Oh. Yeah, everything, but we don't have time. <laughs> we don't have time. That'll be another video, right? Because yeah. you and I are going to have another conversation about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And then, of course, we'll have many conversations about macro politics and you coming back on with Tom at some point once a yeah. month. I really, really appreciate. And uh, thank you very, very much. I'll have all oh, the... Thank you. It was a pleasure. I, you know, if somebody wants to talk about my day job, you know, I'm... I could talk all day. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. All the links in the description below. Go check this out. And uh, fill your pockets with trend following profits. Trend follower Alex and trend follower Rich signing up. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.